If you have your Bible, you can turn to Philippians chapter 4. That's where we're going to camp out today. That's where we're going to be for our entire time together. And as, as we've already mentioned a couple of times this morning, Marilyn, who is home from Mexico, from the mission field, uh, this is the season of peace, right? Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Peace is the most sought after, quote unquote, commodity in our hectic lives, isn't it? And the, the, the amount of times that we must think about, oh, if I could just have a little peace, peace, right? And, and the truth is, we will go to great lengths to compromise for the sake of peace. If you think about it, governments have spent countless hours in negotiations with neighboring nations to ensure that they remain in peace. Businesses will spend countless amounts of money and buy themselves out of conflicts for the sake of peace. In our homes, we compromise with our children for the sake of peace, don't we? We bargain for peace, okay? We bargain for peace. And yet, after all of these things, peace is often absent. That's because peace has a great price. You can't demand it. You can't purchase it. You can't even invent it, invent it or create it. And peace is important because when we lose peace, what happens? We become self-conscious. We become guilty. We feel discouraged and defeated. We become critical and divisive. We give in to temptation. But as I just prayed a couple times in praying over Katie, and as I've been thinking all week, and I think Chris Turner was the first one to tell me this about 10 or 11 years ago when she heard it, that peace is not the absence of trouble, but it's the presence of Jesus. And you know, this Advent thing that we do with the, with the um, these, this is real fire, right? With the Advent that we do, the remote controlled start, right? Uh, the remote controlled flames, this Advent that we do, it might seem a little weird, it might seem a little, you know, awkward that we include this in, as part of our service for four weeks leading up to Christmas, but the reason that we do is the Advent is all about creating the anticipation for the coming King. Because when you think about the, oh, this is so important. I get a little excited about this. When you think about the entire Old Testament longing for the Savior that now was coming at Christmas, being born of a virgin, right? Bringing and being. See, see, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough to just talk about in this season of Advent that Jesus brings hope. That Jesus brings joy. That Jesus brings peace. That Jesus, next week as we talk about, spoiler alert, bring, Jesus brings love because that cheapens what's really happening. Jesus is a person that is hope. Without Jesus... There's no hope. Jesus is joy. Amen. He is joy. We can try to manufacture and fake joy as much as possible without having the person of Jesus at work within us, but it's just that. It's manufactured and counterfeit. And Jesus is peace. Peace is not the absence of your circumstances. It is not an empty calendar. You can be sitting on your couch numbing yourself with hours of TV and still be anxious. You can, you can, you can be in the most peaceful setting on the planet, on a, at a, on a log cabin on a lake. That's like my, my dream, in a little rock, wooden rocking chair, preferably one of those from Cracker Barrel that has the North Carolina emblem on it. <laughs> that I see in all the Cracker Barrels in North Carolina, right? Sitting on a rocking chair by a lake, right? That is like the, big, the, the most pic, beautiful picture of peace. My cell phone doesn't work or is in the bottom of the lake, said lake, okay, right? And, and, and I can be sitting right there on that deck watching my children play and, and, and sitting right next to Kristen and, and, and that, that like just a beautiful picture of peace and yet be full of anxious thoughts. Because if Jesus is not present in our minds, there's no peace. And then Jesus is, and we see this all throughout Scripture, God is love. Jesus brings love, and He is 
love. And so it's not enough for us when we think about this season to just think, oh, this is, this is sweet and this is the tradition and this is what we're doing. No, it's more than that because we're celebrating with anticipation that Jesus is these things in our life. And without Him, it's impossible to experience Him, to truly experience hope, to truly experience peace, and to truly walk in joy. So, my question for us today and where we're going and what we're talking about is how do I, how do we maintain the peace of God in our lives? We can experience flashes of it, but how do we keep the peace of God ruling and reigning within our souls? How do we stay aware that God's very presence is within us, and not just within us, but, and not just, but the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is in us. And for us, the book of Philippians, specifically in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, which is where we're going to be, like I said, contains the process by which we achieve peace. Now, this isn't like a, I, I, I went away from steps. You'll see six actions to peace, because I was talking to Dylan, I don't want this to feel like a, like a step thing. You do this, then this, then this. No, because for many of us, we equate peace, like I've already talked about, with sitting, with doing nothing. And for, and for some of us, we need a little bit more of that in our lives, but that's not necessarily the key. Sometimes we've got to do some things to get peace. Sometimes we've got to do some things to get peace. I had somebody tell me one time, one that works with their mind rests with their hands. Someone that works with their hands rests with their mind. Right? And so it's not necessarily just stopping and, and, and not doing anything. Sometimes it's actions that create peace in our lives. And so I want us to talk about six actions from, right from Philippians 4 that we're going to see as we talk through this that we must take if we want to rest in peace. You ready? Okay, for the three of you. All right, come on now. <laughs> somebody, somebody told me this morning that, um, that I should try at some point yelling, wake up in the middle of the service just to see what happens. And so don't, don't make me go there because I said, oh, that'll never happen. You guys are always so engaged. You just proved me wrong. Philippians 4, starting in verse 1, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers who, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. That's pretty important if he's repeating himself. Verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Reasonableness is another word for gentleness. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. How dare he say that? Does he not know my life? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. See, see Paul, doesn't even, Paul doesn't even talk about peace being an object. The God of peace will be with you. Paul, Paul says it right there that, 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 that do these things. Follow these actions. And the God of peace will be with you. What's the first thing he says there? I'm glad you asked. I want you to first notice um, <laughs> if, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at Paul's writing I love how he talks to the church at Philippi and he does this he wrote two thirds of the New Testament he does this all throughout his writing but he talks to the church with such affection he talks to the church with such affection. If I'm Philippi, right? 
There are some hard things that he has said in this book. But it is clear that he has earned the right to be heard by the churches because of his love for them. And he even writes it. Whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. What a beautiful opening sentence here in chapter 4. Fun fact for you though, in chapter 3, at the beginning of chapter 3, he says, finally, my brothers, and here we are opening a whole other chapter. So he was a good preacher. Right? I say in closing and then preach for 30 more minutes. And that's just a tease, right? But he says first here in verse 1, stand firm thus in what? The Lord. Stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. So the first action that we've got to take if we want to have peace in our lives, if we want to live with peace in our lives, is to stand firm. Paul has just stated in chapter 3 that there are enemies of Jesus, but that our citizenship is in heaven. That we don't belong here, that this is not our home. So Paul now says, in light of that, to stand firm in the Lord. The definition here of standing firm is simply to hold fast, to persist, to persevere, to not give up. I want you to imagine this morning a soldier standing firm against the attack of the, attack of the enemy, refusing to give ground no matter the pressure or the strength of the attack. For some of you parents, this might be your kids. And you're standing firm with that bedtime, or you're standing firm with that no screen thing, or you're standing firm with no dessert until all the broccoli is eaten. Okay, at least two pieces. <laughs> is that anybody else? Okay, so imagine, you can, you can think about a soldier, or you could just think about yourself, right, in this, standing firm against the attack of the enemy. I'm not calling your kids the enemy, but if the shoe fits, no, okay, refusing to give ground no matter the pressure or the strength of the attack, doesn't flinch, not unstable, never defeated. And, and, and here's the thing when it comes to standing firm, family. As the body of Christ, the church, his bride, we must stand firm. No matter how great the trial, no matter how strong the pressure of the temptation to give in, to the, to the agendas of people or, or, or what have you, no matter how great the influence and allure of giving up. And we've got to remember that the strength to stand firm comes from one source. God. We must resolve to not give up, but to press into God. See, the resolve to stand firm is a choice. And we, we talk about all the time, right? Pe preaching the gospel to yourself, reminding yourself. One of my favorite things uh, to, to do um, Sunday after Sunday with the setup team that comes here at 745 to set up. And one of the things I, I, I always like to remind them of is remember why we're doing this. Because people are going to show up at 1005 or 1010 or 1015 <laughs> to worship. Right? <laughs> That was not a personal attack. <laughs> that was not a personal attack. Right? But people are going to come, and they're going to want to, and they're, and they're coming so that they can sing songs together. They're coming so that they can look at God's Word together. They're coming so that we can, we can hear from the Lord, so that we can grow in Him, so that we can grow together. We're coming so that we can be inspired by God to walk with Him. Amen. Remember that why. Remember that why. And it's, and it's a resolve to stand firm no matter what. It's preaching the gospel to you. It's reminding yourself of the why. And listen to me, family. It would do us well, I believe, as the body of Christ, to remind us why we exist. The church does not exist for entertainment. Yet so many of us just long to show up here on Sunday mornings 
at 9.45, 9.55 to be entertained. The church does not exist, right, to be a social club. The church is not, does not exist to be the judge of people's life. No, the church exists as the body of Christ, God's plan to save and change the world. The church exists to spread the gospel. Therefore, you are ambassadors for Christ. Paul tells the church at Corinth, God making his appeal to the world through you. That's why we exist. That's why we exist. Stand firm. If we want to have a little peace in our lives, then we can't sit on the fence, right? You ever talk to that person, they've got one foot out the door? It's hard to trust that, isn't it? Let me tell you something. If there is any area of your life where you're sitting on the fence, you've got one foot out the door, you cannot expect to have peace in that area of your life. You can't expect. You cannot expect to have peace in that job if you're already checked out. You cannot expect to have peace in that marriage if you're considering something different. You cannot expect to have peace in that church if you just walk around frustrated and critical all the time. You cannot expect to have peace. You get the picture. And so in those areas of your life, resolve to stand firm, like Paul says, in the Lord. My beloved. And then he keeps going. Look at verses 2 and 3. I love this story. I entreat Judea and I entreat Sentai to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, I want to start with the end there. It is clear here that Paul makes it very clear that these, that these are people in the family. Right? There's people in the family. But how many of you know, how many of you have been a part of big families? Okay, big families, big family. Okay, big families. Awesome. I see those hands. Awesome. This is going to help you. Okay? All right, clue in. How many of you know that when you're in a family, it doesn't have to be a big family, but, 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 but more times than not, big, bigger families have bigger conflicts, right? Anybody never experienced a conflict in your family that could stand up and teach it? Never a conflict in your family? Oh, okay. I was about to say, you misheard me. Okay. Very good. Very good. Very good. Right? But we see here that who Paul is talking to, they're members of the fam. Right? They're members of the fam. And sometimes, we were, we were, we were sitting um, around a table recently, and somebody said, uh, to, you know, sometimes good teams have to do what we call rumble. Right? Sometimes you just got to rumble. Right? And sometimes, sometimes you just, sometimes if there's conflict, you just got to rumble. Because, because how, how many of us know that a lot of times we like to try to just deal with conflict with let's just not talk about it, let's not acknowledge it, it's going to go away someday, right? But then if you're one of the causes of that conflict, have you ever considered how awkward that makes the rest of the people around you feel? Awkward. Right? And so, and so right, and so what, what Paul's talking about here, and he does it very non-gracefully, if I'm being honest. He says, tell Yudia, tell Sintai, because there was clearly a disagreement. We don't get to know the disagreement. It might, it might have been because of the, 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 the loudness of the music or the selection of the songs or the, the, the Bible translation they were using at the time, maybe the Christmas decorations that they had on the stage, and, and Yudia thought it should be one thing and Sintai thought it should be another thing, or where they placed the bulletins or where they put the welcome center in the house. Right? I, who knows the disagreement that was happening? color of the carpet, the stained glass windows, those are, those are classic ones, right, that they would have no doubt had at the church of Philippi, right? Who knows what the disagreement was? 
But Paul very non-gracefully, again, he, he just says to the church of Philippi, whoever the, the, the readers of, of this letter is, who, who, who is going to stand up and be responsible for reporting from Paul back to the church, tell Judea, tell Syntyche to knock it off. Knock it off. He says, he says, tell you to tell Syntyche to agree in the Lord, right? To put their differences aside, to find the common ground. Because here's the deal, family. Again, I started with making sure that we know that all of these people, Clement, Yudia, Syntyche, they're all family in the Lord. They're Christians. Their eternal destination is together. Amen. Their mansions might be in the same neighborhood, cul-de-sac, in eternity. Right? I'm not saying that there's necessarily going to be cul-de-sacs in eternity. Right? But don't quote me on that. It's not in Scripture. Okay, but anyway. Their eternal destination is together. Now here's what Paul is saying with that. Here's what we can take from that. If our eternal destination is heaven, together, there is some place for each and every one of us in this room to find common ground. That does not mean... And do not hear when we talk about an action to peace. Go ahead and throw up the second one, Kenneth. Agreement, right? That does not mean agreement and unity, that we are all going to find agreement in the same things, right? Some of my closest friends that pastor churches that are incredible, that if I didn't attend here, I would go to, we disagree on some things. We disagree on some things, but it's okay. We still love each other, and sometimes we like to even poke at those things that we disagree with just to, you know, get a rise out of it, because that's what family does, right? But we, but we have found common ground that means way more to us than those disagreements, and you should too. I don't know if I've told the story lately, but I always enjoy telling the story of my friend Ken Smith, who lives in Iowa now. Ken Smith was on the uh, pastor search committee that brought the Bush family to Maine many, many years ago, and Ken was the communicator with all of the candidates, and so I would get phone calls and emails from Ken. And Ken liked to email late at night, and so, you know, emails from the search committee wouldn't typically come until after 11 p.m. Because, well, anyway, I won't bore you with that story, but fun, sto fun story. Ken used to tell me and come up to me about once a quarter, just to remind me. And Ken would walk down the aisle and say, you know, Travis, just want to remind you that I cannot stand our music. So encouraging. <laughs> so encouraging. I cannot stand our music. But he would look around and he would point to other folks, but he would say, and, he, and he'd look back at me and said, but it's a good thing it's not about me. See, Ken found the common ground in the church not to be the music, but the message we preached. Not to be the style, but what we stood for. Not to be the length of the preaching, but the people that he got to be around Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I believe it would do us well and take us a long way with peace if we stepped back out of ourselves and said, you know what? This really bothers me. This might even rub me the wrong way. But am I letting it steal my joy? Am I letting it steal my peace? Because there's bigger things that's, that speak. There's bigger things at stake. See, it's hard to have peace if people are arguing. Amen? It's hard to have peace if people are grumbling. It's hard to have peace where there's criticism. And our flesh often leads us to ignore the truth that things are really okay. Yeah. That it's going to be just fine. Paul knew the nature of the people of Philippi. 
And he knew that there were some being critical, arguing, grumbling, quarreling. I heard, I heard somebody say this past week, uh, they're, they're, n- n- never mind, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't do, I can't do that, John, I'm sorry. But we don't, we don't know, again, what these folks, Yudia and Syntyche, were arguing about. But if we can't agree in the flesh, we ought to always be able to agree in the Lord. And so again, think about how you're going to spend eternity with the people around you right now. That's a long time. Instead of writing people off, maybe we should find some common ground. Because if we're both children of God, there are things that we can agree on. Always. And celebrate that. Let the rest be the rest. And I believe in the church that there's no time for arguing and divisiveness. There's time for truth. To proclaim truth. You can be upset about things for a season and then you'll see it my way. But we are called as God's beloved, as Paul calls the church at Philippi, his beloved, to fight for the unity of the church this side of heaven that all may know peace. It's a choice. Just like standing firm and the resolve to stand firm Agreement and unity is a choice that we make because we can let those things bother us and steal our joy when we walk in the room. Or we can believe, well, maybe they weren't just trying to hurt my feelings. So I'll give them grace. And then number three, the third thing we've got to do in order to get peace Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Not just on special occasions, but always. This means continually, repeatedly, again and again and again. Rejoice at what God is doing around you. And if you don't see it, see, we're going to talk about this in just a few minutes. I've I've come to realize that I've got to be careful the people I surround myself with sometimes. Because you can surround yourself with people that are all glass half empty people. Right? And so you can become discouraged about things just repeatedly, left and right. And then you go talk to some other folks, and, 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 or like Lois. You, you have a conversation with Lois. For those of you that might be new or recent with us, she's the one that sits out there and hands you a bulletin and prays for you as you're walking in, every single one of you. If you come through this door, you're really missing out. Because Lois probably isn't praying for you. She doesn't know you're here. Okay, but if you come through this door, you're blessed. Because Lois is, Lois is praying for you, right? If you talk to Lois, it's hard to have a bad day. It's hard to have a bad day. Right? She's always going to be uplifting. She's all, the glass is not half full for her. It's overflowing. Right? And so some of you, it's not an issue of God's not doing in, in things in your life. It's that you're hearing too much crud. I almost said a bad word in church. Right? Okay? So, so rejoice in the Lord. Things may not look the way I want them to look. Things may seem underwhelming, but I can celebrate how they are exactly how God would have them right now. Things are exactly how God would have them right now. Now listen, listen. I know circumstances in your life may be tough. I know the next 24 hours of your life may look doom and gloom. But I trust in the sovereignty of God that God has each and every one of you exactly where He wants you right now. And I can't answer the why of that is you. Stop looking at me. I can't answer the why for you. That's God. Because He says in Scripture, His ways are not 
our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And as high as the heavens are above the earth are his thoughts and our thoughts. So how he is choosing to produce maturity in you and in your walk with him and, 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 and the things that he's doing as a result of that, I can't explain to you. I know some of you think I have a direct line to him and he tells me things that he doesn't tell you. That's not real. You have as much access. Spoiler alert. Right? But no matter what the circumstances are in your life right now, it's choosing to rejoice. When I stop, when I look around at what God has blessed me with, I am overwhelmed with the joy and the gratitude that I get to walk this life Amen. with the people that I get to walk it with. Are there things that are underwhelming in my life? Sure. Sure. Are there things that I would change in my life right now? Sure. I just described to you a log cabin with a, with a very specific rocking chair. Sure. Sure. But you know what? I have everything I need. And truly, truthfully, I have everything I want. If Paul, who when writing this is in prison, we know that from Philippians chapter 1, you can go check that out on your own time. He's writing in, in chains, house arrest more than likely under the Praetorian Guard. Which were the big deal. They were they were the big they were the big guys back then. They were the guys you didn't mess with, right? Like my, like myself and Tom Turner. Okay, you just didn't, right? But if Paul, who is in prison, can rejoice in the Lord under his circumstances, then he can rightly call. Hear me, hear me, hear me. He can rightly call and expect us to rejoice. In the midst of our issues, in the midst of our problems, no matter the circumstances. All right, we've got to get moving. Y'all got to stop distracting me. Number five. Number four. Wow, we really got to get moving. <laughs> Number four, look at verse five. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Okay, again, the, another word for reasonableness, gentleness, right? So strong gentleness. The word in verse five is a tough one to translate that reasonableness word into English. Um, according to many commentators, some have translated it gentleness. That's why we went with because it, it, most of the commentators translated that uh, consideration, agreeableness, right? Courtesy, patience, softness. Does that describe anybody, right? But but there's a guy by the name of William Barclay that said the word has the idea. Get this of justice in it. So a strong gentleness, that word reasonableness has, a, has the idea of justice in it, but that the meaning goes far beyond mere justice and claims that there's something better than justice, and that's a gracious gentleness. So again, that's why we go with gentleness. You let your gentleness, let your strong gentleness be known to everyone. We can imagine that peace would consume every single one of our gatherings if we were a little more gentle and gracious towards one another, or maybe just a little more tolerant with one another. Right? A little more tolerant with one another. Um, I, I, I enjoy, this, this is a little bit of confession. You shouldn't use the pulpit as therapy. I'm not doing that. I'm just confessing to you something in my life that I like. I, uh, recently, and it's actually a, a funny long story that I'll tell you uh, over coffee sometime if you want. Um, but I've, I've gotten into country music over the last five years. Now that's new for me, okay? And every time that Ian gets into my car... And there's country music on. He doesn't respond in the most gracious way. And I long for him to be a little bit more agreeable with country music. Because there's some good stories. Let's not let the loudest amen be about country music. But... Every one of our gatherings would be a little bit more peaceful if we would be more gracious and tolerant with one another. To consider that there are reasons that we act or do the things that we do. I heard a saying one time that grieved me for the church of Jesus. And I hope it grieves you today. 
that the church of Jesus is known more for what it's against than what it's for. May that not be so of Summit Church. May we be known way more for what we're for. The love of Jesus. The hope of Christ. The peace. And the joy that He brings at His birth and seals at His death and resurrection than what we're against. And notice how Paul charges us. This is huge. This is huge. Hear this. Then we'll get to number five. Notice how Paul charges us to be gentle with everyone. He says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand, not just one another. Let's think about the woman caught in adultery or the woman at the well in John 4, David and Bathsheba story. When the woman with adultery specifically was brought before Jesus, he could have applied the letter of the law and she, and, and she should, according to it, have been stoned. But, it went, but he went beyond justice. And as far as justice goes, there's not one of us who deserves the grace that God gives but he gives it to us anyway. And so we can all agree that God has been gentle with us. We're sitting here this morning. There's heat. There's cushioned chairs. We're not paying rent for this. God's been gentle to us. We can be gentle to one another and to people outside of these four walls. Paul lays it down that the mark of a Christian, that the mark of a believer in their personal relationship with others must be that we know when and when not to insist on our own way. Once we possess the peace of God, how do we maintain it? It's a great question. These last two points of peace, these last two actions of peace, they're what one commentator called the, the maintenance actions. They're the two most important actions. And if we follow them, the peace of God will rule and reign in our hearts. Number five, prayer. Look at verses six and seven. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Everybody say everything. everything. By prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving. Hmm. with a thankful heart, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, I'm so glad Paul says that, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We are charged by Paul, as the church, to be anxious for nothing. How insensitive is that? That means not worrying or fretting about a single thing. The word nothing in the Greek is a word called meodin, me and then odin, okay? It means not even one thing. And so humanly speaking, fo follow me here, hang with me here, the Philippians had every reason to worry and be anxious. Hear this. They were suffering persecution. They were facing disunity and quarreling in the church. They had some toxic members within their fellowship who were prideful, super spiritual, self-centered, and they were facing some false teachers who had joined their fellowship, and the teachers were fierce in attacking the truth of Jesus. So glad things have come a long way. <laughs> that there is no pride in the church of 2022. That there is no one super spiritual and self-centered in the church of 2022. Add to the fact that some were having to struggle for the necessities of life. Food, clothing, shelter. There was little else that could confront this church than that, what they were already dealing with. And so it might sound insensitive for Paul to sit knowing all of these things, and he would have indeed known all of these things that the church of Philippi were facing, might sound insensitive for him to sit there and say, be anxious about nothing. They were facing every trial every temptation imaginable, the kind of thought that causes the most anxiety and worry, and the natural reaction for them would be to worry and be anxious. But Paul knew that the only way they could keep from worrying 
was to receive from God. And how do we do that? Through prayer. See, prayer isn't always about giving our laundry list of things to God, but it's reminding ourselves of who's really in control. And if God is really indeed in control, then whatever temporary, light, momentary affliction, as, as Scripture says, is going to be okay. It's going to work itself out. One way or the other, it's going to be okay. And it might really be hard for a season, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And look at the promise of prayer. He says, with, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And then look at verse 7, because this is huge. This is the crux of peace. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a defense there, isn't there? Paul paints a picture of asking God for intervention because he alone is able to provide the help that we need. And then lastly, the last action is our mindset. Now, I'm not, I'm not being new age here, you know, positive thinking, you know, manifesting things, all, all, of, all, of, all of that. But look at what Paul says. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, definitely not the patriots this year, think about these things. Think about these things. Some of you just lost your peace right there, and you just need to let that go. You just need to let that go. Think about these things. What you've learned and received from heard in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Positive thinking. The kind of thinking that focuses our thoughts until they shape our behavior. <clears throat> hey, if she wants to come help me preach, I'm good with it. Okay? We are wherever we store our minds. And we become what we think. A person who centers their thoughts on this world and its things will live for the world and its things. Money, wealth, etc. Happiness, a mind set upon the world and flesh can only lead to anxiety, worry, emptiness, and restlessness. There can be no peace. But we know peace. And he's bigger than those things. And so positive thinking then, a right mindset thinking then, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, blocks out the fleshly, worldly, selfish, sinful, or evil thoughts that attempt to enter our mind. And Paul charges us to practice positive thinking, right thinking. And so this morning, as we read those actions, are you searching for peace? Are you doing these things? Are you standing firm? Are you being gentle? Are you fighting for the unity around you? I love how Paul wraps up this section in verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things. Now, that should be encouraging for every person in this room. Because here's the deal. We're not going to perfect peace this side of heaven. It's a real bummer, isn't it? Like, gee, Travis, I want my money back. Practice these things. Paul tells Timothy, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Because what's the goal this side of heaven? The goal is maturity. The goal as we go through hard things in our lives is that hopefully we get a little bit stronger. But there's still an enemy out there that loves to steal, kill, and destroy. And so it's not possible this side of eternity to live in perfect peace. But he says to practice these things. Practice these things. Practice standing firm. Practice praying. Practice meditating and thinking on the right things. Practice the discipline of peace and doing these things. And so I just want to be really practical and give you three things that I think we need to do. 
to gain a little bit more peace in our lives. And we're going to go really quick with these. Number one, number one, and they all start with evaluate because these aren't going to be on the screen. Ken's not forgetting to put them up. I told him I added them this morning, and so <clears throat> they're not going to be up there. <clears throat> but evaluate three things, three areas of my life. Number one, evaluate what's coming in. If Paul says to think about these things, what's good, what's right, what's honorable, if he says to think about these things, then we ought to try to limit the things that are coming in that are not that. Limit the time around negativity. Limit the time around a critical heart. I'm not saying you can cut it out completely, because again, we're called to be missionaries, right? We're called to be salt and light, but we can limit the inputs. We can limit the toxic things that come into the mind, and therefore it creeps into the heart. We've got to evaluate what's coming in. For some of us, there's way too much junk coming in. In fact, a lot of studies are being shown right now thanks to technology, and I'm not, I'm not knocking technology. I've got a lot of it up here on my table to help me preach, right? Um, I ignore some of it. I've got my phone up here to keep an eye on the time. I never look at it, so it shows you how much it helps me, okay? <clears throat> but, thanks, but a lot of studies are being done right now to show that we are not meant to consume all of the input that is coming in day after day after day after day. And so we've got to evaluate what's coming in. Evaluate what's coming in. My question for you is, is the only time do you hear Scripture is Sunday morning? Check that. Evaluate that. Evaluate that. Second thing I want you to evaluate. Your priorities evaluate your priorities. Do you have priorities? Can you sit and think to yourself, wow, if I'm going to invest my time, if I'm going to invest my thinking into anything, it's going to be things that have to do with, with these, right? Check your priorities. Check the order of your priorities. And then lastly, evaluate the practice plan. The practice plan. Paul says to practice these things, standing firm, rejoicing in the Lord, agreement and unity, the mindset, the prayer. Practice these things. And so every, every day, every day, evaluate how am I doing on these things? How am I practicing? I, I go to softball practice. I'm an assistant coach every week and when I when I get there I'm supposed to I'm supposed to be there a little bit early and on the counter when you walk in there's a practice plan it's two-sided and my first job when I show up to practice is to look at the practice plan so that I know what we're doing so that when we get to the next thing I can help organize it I can help set it up I can help right and so many of us have just become reactionary in our Christian lives that we're not advancing anything. <clears throat> we're just reacting to what's being thrown at us. Evaluate that practice plan. Am I praying every day? What am I thinking about today? Who am I in disagreement with? Maybe I need to go pray with them. Maybe I need to go spend some time with them so that we can get back to a common ground so that we can find peace together. In an area, maybe 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 I just need to stand firm. Maybe maybe my maybe maybe I've got one foot out the door here, and maybe I just need to plug back in. Maybe I need to just sink back in. Maybe I need to take my spouse out on a date and just say, you know what? I'm here. I'm not. I'm I'm in. And we haven't done this in a while. And I just need to I just need to remind you that I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. Maybe I need to do that with my kids. Maybe I need to take them right. And I need to just remind them that I'm here. Right. <clears throat> I'm plugged in. I'm invested. And I believe if we do those things as the worship team comes, we can walk in a little bit more peace than we did when we walked in. Check what's coming in. Check your priorities. 
as you look at these six things we talked about this morning? What's an area that you sit and say, man, you know what, Travis? I need that in my life. I need that in my life. And so I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray a little bit differently this morning. My prayer for each and every one of you is going to be similar to that of Paul. So I believe he's praying for peace here for the church at Philippi. And I believe that if we can walk in anything, <clears throat> if we can walk in anything, I don't know about you, every year one of these Sundays of Advent just hits me a little bit harder than the others. You know, most years it's joy. Hope was a few years ago. Love. But there was something about peace this year. Because I know there's a lot of folks around me that need a little peace in their lives. And so my prayer for you today, as we close and as these guys sing, Come Thou Fountain, is I'm praying peace for your family. And so if you want to do something, I believe it's symbolic, if you just want to sit there and just hold your hands open to receive this prayer this morning as I pray peace in your life. Father, thank you that you're not only the giver of peace, but you are peace. And when we see in John that Jesus came and was made manifest among us, was brought to life among us. God, that with that, He brought peace. And so God, that's why we as the church, we as your body can get so excited about peace this year because it comes. We're celebrating the life of peace. And God, we recognize this morning as we're here together <clears throat> that we cannot attain perfect peace this side of heaven, but I pray that whatever anxious thoughts, whatever disagreement, whatever frustration, whatever anger, whatever bitterness, whatever financial need or want, whatever relational need there is in this room, sickness, <clears throat> pain, loss, whatever is represented in this room. And I believe if we went around, a lot of those, if not all, would be represented in this room. I pray that the folks here would feel a greater sense of peace in that area. Or at least walk out of here with a practice plan of gaining more peace in those areas. And so God, there's a lot more I want to say, <clears throat> but I believe you're done. And so I pray that you have accomplished what you've wanted in this room this morning. May we walk in peace today to the best way we know how. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.